People of God, we have been gathered through worship to join in thanks singing, in thanks seeking, in thanks praising, in thanks doing, in thanks praying, and in thanksgiving. Let us bring our joyful hearts filled with gratitude before our God this day. Creator God, we come to celebrate the beauty and bounty of your good earth. Glorious blue skies and blazing fall colors, fields ripe for harvest and gardens overflowing with goodness. Grant us thankful hearts, we pray. May our prayers and our lives overflow with gratitude. We offer this worship to your glory now and always. Amen. Now, friends, with hearts filled with gratitude, I invite you to turn to one another and share the joy you have and the peace of Christ. Peace of Christ with you all. Bless us. The Lord hath been mindful. 
Their ears are pink, their teeth are white, they run about the house at night. They nibble things they shouldn't touch, and no one seems to like them much. But I think mice are rather nice. That's a poem from my childhood. And there's a young person in my life right now who keeps telling me every day, the mice are coming, the mice are coming. And the thing about that poem is, I do not think mice are nice. I don't like them. They creep me out. And yet, I share a world with them. And on this Thanksgiving Day, I'd like you to think about the things that you actually don't like. Like things you don't prefer, things you wouldn't choose. And how even in those moments, can we say thank you? There are things maybe you don't like uh, at the Thanksgiving table. Uh, olives, maybe turnip, maybe you don't even like pumpkin pie. You know, it's not for everybody. And I'm grateful that we live in a world where we do have choices. And so even as I learn to live with mice, and I saw one out in my yard this week. We can learn to be grateful for all the choices we have and to give thanks to God for making it that way. I have a little mouse that I do like, and this one sits in my office. I hope you can see him. He's a little tiny brass mouse with a candle. And I love that he is this little tiny creature carrying light. And so that's what we are too. Whether you are a, a young child or a child at heart, each of us do our own part in carrying God's tiny little light out in the world with our lives and with our thanksgiving. Oh 
The reading for this week comes from Deuteronomy 26, verses 1 to 11. When you have come into the land that the Lord your God is giving you as an inheritance to bless, and you possess it and settle in it, you shall take some of the first of all the fruit of the ground, which you harvest from the land that the Lord your God is giving you, and you shall put in a basket and go to the place that the Lord your God will choose as a dwelling for his name. You shall go to the priest who is in office at that time and say to him, Today I declare to the Lord your God that I have come into the land that the Lord swore to our ancestors to give us. When the priest takes the basket from your hand and sets it down before the altar of your God, you shall make this response before the Lord your God. A wandering Aramean was my ancestor. He went down into Egypt and lived there as an alien, few in number, and there became a great nation, mighty and populous. When the Egyptians treated us harshly and afflicted us by imposing hard labor on us, we cried to the Lord, the God of our ancestors. The Lord heard our voice and saw our affliction, our toil and our oppression. The Lord brought us out of Egypt with a mighty hand and an outstretched arm, with a terrifying display of power and with signs and wonders. And he brought us into this place and gave us this land, a land flowing with milk and honey. So now I bring the first of the fruit of the ground that you, O Lord, have given me. You shall set it down before the Lord your God and bow down before the Lord your God. Then you, together with the Levites and the aliens who reside among you, shall celebrate with all the bounty that the Lord your God has given to you and to your house. Here ends the lesson. Praise be to God. i
It is Thanksgiving. Let's get the table ready. Deuteronomy 26 is this beautiful piece of writing that speaks of bringing the first fruits of the harvest to the temple. God asked the people to bring the first fruits, the best of the ground, the, the freshest stuff they have from the fields, and offer it to the priests. And when they gather, they are to tell the story of their history with God, their history of God's love for them. It's a great follow-up to the passage from Exodus last week, which was about the Exodus story, because this is a, a piece of scripture from after they've arrived in the Promised Land. And they are to bring on this one day their first fruits and to offer up the story of the whole history of their people, starting with a wandering Aramean, that's Abraham, and ending with the Passover event when God rescues them from the hands of the Egyptians. It's great that telling the story of God's love is part of bringing our first fruits. Our stories of God's love can be part of the first fruits. And I, I love the piece about inclusion. It says this in verse 11. Then you, together with the Levites and the aliens which reside among you, shall celebrate with all the bounty that the Lord your God has given to you and to your house. In the storytelling, in the thanksgiving, in the offering of first fruits, they are to include the strangers and the Gentiles among them. I think that inclusiveness in thanksgiving is so beautiful. Friends, thanksgiving for me has held a special place in my life forever because of the fond, fond childhood memories I have for many years approximately 12, 15 years of my childhood in Nova Scotia. My family would journey down into the Annapolis Valley to my mother's hometown first, Bridgetown, Nova Scotia. And for the Friday night, Saturday and Sunday, we would celebrate together. And on the Sunday, there'd be a beautiful big meal at my Nana Pratt's house, my mom's mom. I remember it fondly because there was always two or three types of pie and two or three types of ice cream offered on Thanksgiving Sunday. But even more important to me was the gathering of the Thanksgiving centerpiece. My dad would take us out into the foothills of the South Mountain of uh, the Annapolis Valley and we'd gather the biggest, brightest maple leaves we could find to decorate all around as a centerpiece. And we'd grab uh, uh, chestnuts that had fallen to the ground, just the little brown inside part and we'd lay them all around and then we'd take apples and dad showed us how to polish them against our shirts or our jeans and we put these shiny apples in the centerpiece as well. And then when we gathered at the table there would be a beautiful Thanksgiving centerpiece created by my dad and myself and my siblings. It was always a special moment. Then on the Monday morning, on Thanksgiving Monday, we'd get up and we'd head up the Annapolis Valley, a little closer to Halifax, just outside of Kentville, Nova Scotia, or, which is uh, near Centerville, which then was near Lakeville, and a lot of villes, I guess, but Lakeville, out just outside of Lakeville, uh, on Tory Lane, there was my dad's parents' uh, family retreat, right there on a gorgeous patch of old orchard land, right just in front of a big cornfield. There was the No Barn Farm. That was what we called it, No Barn. It seems like two words when I say it today, but it was a name for my whole life. No barn has been a name because it was a farmhouse, you see, without a barn. Naturally, no barn was a perfect name for it, right? Well, no barn was where we'd spend our Thanksgiving Mondays for 12 years of my childhood. It always began with a football game between the unks and the punks. The uncles would play against uh, the cousins. And uh, it took them many years to stop having that as a tackle game. You know, what was interesting is the uncles got a little older and easier to injure. I noticed it was then that they switched it to a flag football game. So the unks would take on the punks for the coveted title of what we called the toilet bowl. Sounds a little rude, but that's what we called it. There was the, the uh, honorary marching onto the field and the plunging of the toilet and the white swan player of the game, which was a toilet roll, a toilet paper roll inscribed with the player, the MVP of the game. It was always a great game filled with lots of laughter and, 
anybody's new football move they had developed over the year. I wanted to read a plaque that I have here about the no barn. My grandfather had this plaque made up. It has a painting of no barn farm on it, as you can see. And it has the uh, two writings that my grandparents wrote in their uh, no barn journal on the final day of their residency there. And I'm gonna read my grandfather's piece because it is filled with such words of thanksgiving and gratitude. On this day, cloudy, but with sun by times, temperature 72 Fahrenheit, Marjorie and I concluded our tenancy of the No Barn Farm. Thankful for the experience of growing and the fellowship of family that attended our days spent there. Our first dedication of our guest book record was to those who maintain the rural countryside in all of its splendor. And our last entry is made with them in mind and grateful that we were able to contribute to and share in their lifestyle. In the warmth of this sunshine, I look on herds and hills and try to capture a picture which we will miss. It has been good. At the No Barn Farm, there was always many people on Thanksgiving Monday. Cousins and second cousins and first cousins once removed and probably second cousins twice removed for that matter. And often the uh, adult cousins would bring friends so there was always a few strangers in the family mix. And there was dogs and cats and rowdiness and laughter. But always, of course, a big table filled with God's bounty direct from my grandparents' garden next to the no barn. The table was always a beautiful thing. It was actually two or three tables put together with two fireplaces going and a long row of uh, benches and the cousins would all gather on one particular bench. I actually have a great picture of our cousins, my cousins gathered for the meal. Of course, I'm, I'm the cutest kid in the picture if I ever show it to you. The tradition of Thanksgiving for each of us has always involved loading up a table of good food and giving thanks for God's blessing. Today I'm wondering if we were to imagine Thanksgiving dinner with God, what would God's harvest table look like? Well, today as an act of gratitude, I'd like to share with you what I think God's harvest table looks like. It looks like the elder statesmen of this congregation who have a handshake and a word of kindness for everyone as they come in the door or during this COVID time, of course, faithfully continue to weave community during, through phone calls and email check-ins. It's the wise women of Shaughnessy Heights United Church who live out compassion in the church and in the world and who teach us all about what commitment to a family of faith looks like and what God's call for justice sounds like. It's the new family who in an act of great courage decides to bring their baby or child here for baptism. It's the newcomer who may come upon troubling times and is looking for comfort and whom right now at this moment may be watching us online. It's a person that realizes there's more to life than what they were taught and joins us in seeking a new relationship with God. There are those who've grown up in the church and join us for a sense of tradition and familiarity. There's, love, there's those who love to sing the old hymns because it reminds them of standing next to their mother in church. There are those who are excited to see a hand drum or hear a jazzy piano and those who like to sing the same words and same melody over and over until it washes over them, helping them feel closer to God. There are those who dislike change because it feels like loss or grief or something in our guts we just can't explain. And those who lurch forward hoping that others will follow with a smile and a laugh if we just pray enough. There are those who love nature and are energized by the wild forest the high mountain, the seaside beach, a quiet lake or a river. And there are true city folks who love the pulse and rhythm of a large group of people living and working in one place for common goals. There are accountants and bankers, doctors and nurses, teachers and professors, thinkers, consultants, 
business owners, CEOs, founders, and nonprofit leaders, and so many more. There are those with creaky bones and history in their eyes, and those who can't yet speak, but look around with wonder and gurgle as you pass by. There are those with hope to spare, and those who desperately need to hear the good news. Worried people, those living and those living in the right now, those who are broken down and those who will hold your hand. We have grumpy people, laughing people, awkward people, loud people, slip in and slip out of church people, fellowship people, Sunday brunch people, parents and children and the widowed, 20-somethings and 30-somethings, singles and doubles and everything in between. Friends, this is what God's harvest table looks like. It looks like us. It's hard to believe, but the God who has made us in the image of God, who gathers us together, and the God to whom we give thanks, is the one who gives thanks for us. On this day when we celebrate at so many tables, whether they be cafe size for two, or big tables the size of a bubble. On this day, when we lift up memories of so many other tables of thanksgiving, May we remember that we have all been called into community, called to be God's great harvest table. God has been waiting for us. We are expected. We are God's first fruits. And we have been gathered together in a table of wondrous blessing. In response, in gratitude and in thanks, let us bring the best of ourselves and offer it again to our families, our friends, our neighbors and to the world. Happy Thanksgiving. Amen. Friends, on this Thanksgiving Sunday, on this day of great Thanksgiving, God calls us to bring our first fruits, the best of ourselves, the best of what we have, and offer it here in worship. I invite you to take some time during this beautiful piece of music to dream about what first fruits, what best things, what best parts of you you have to offer to the church and to the world in the weeks to come.
Let us pray. Creator God, as Haydn's wonderful creation song tells us, the heavens are telling the glory of God. The wonders of your works display the firmament. The wonders of your love sustain us through the centuries and the generations. We confess that we have not yet succeeded in preserving your world and dealing with climate change, and that we need to do more to embody your love to the poor, the sick, and the marginalized. We give thanks for the beauty that surrounds us, and for the love and compassion that we receive from others, and that we have the opportunity to extend to others. We give thanks for family and friends, near and far, absent and present. We give thanks for the gifts and leadership of our new ministers and for the chance to connect with them in many different ways during these strange pandemic times. We give thanks for the leadership and dedication of our council chair and our current council as we look forward with excitement and anticipation to implementing our new vision council and a new way of doing things. We give thanks for the continued leadership of our gifted musical leaders as they lead us through the challenges of these pandemic times with new and creative music. We give thanks for all those in our sanctuary choir and for those musicians now able to provide their gifts to us. We give thanks for Nina and Winston and all those providing worship leadership. We give thanks for the stewardship of those who went before us and for the opportunity to provide stewardship to this community and the broader community. We give thanks for the opportunities to continue to serve our community by providing connection, compassion, and social justice to one another and the broader world. We give thanks for frontline medical workers and all those providing medical care and essential services during this pandemic. And we give thanks to those providing leadership in public health here and around the world. We give thanks for the right to vote and for all those participating in the electoral process. We pray for your love and comfort to those who are suffering from anxiety, depression and despair during these COVID times, and especially for those in seniors' homes and hospitals unable to hold and touch those nearest and dearest to them. We pray for your love and comfort to the lonely and the sick. We remember in silence all those known to us suffering from serious illness and facing death and mourning the death of those and mourning the death of those near to them. God, we pray these things trusting in you and knowing that you are with us. We are not alone. Thanks be to God. And now, please join me in the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. God for the harvest that comes from
We have lifted our hearts up with thanksgiving. I call on you now to move out into the world in thanksgiving. Let thanksgiving enhance the joys you experience. Let thanksgiving transcend the pains you may suffer. Let thanksgiving sweeten the duties you have to perform. And let thanksgiving underpin even the griefs you may have to endure. And now may the bountiful love of the Lord of Harvest be with you this day and always. Amen.